Hello and welcome again to another episode of The Master's Class. I am your host for this episode, Nancy Roberts, and joining me to discuss Future Perfect by our very own Dr. Pastor Jerry Ingo, um, The Seven Laws of a Prosperous Christian, we have to my far right, our beautiful sister Amelina. We have our ever brilliant minister Tito, and we have our most excellent Sister Sully. And so welcome back, guys. Welcome back. Welcome Just back. to add to what you all said, something that I noticed with these um, characters is that when you have this conviction, when you walk in confidence, when you walk in defiance, there will always be people around you that are waiting, expecting you to fail. If you take your eyes off of God and you focus on them, you will turn around. You, you will fail in the journey that God has sent you on. But once you place your focus solely on God and you know that you have already prepared and that God is backing you, once you, you, have, you will have this supernatural boldness to walk into any area, to walk into to walk before the king that did not stand for you, to stand before the lion that, you know, has destroyed everybody that has stood before him, to to say to say to the king or to defy the laws that the king has said and said, no, I'm going to continue to pray. There's this boldness that you receive that even when the entire world is waiting for you to fail, you will know that God has already won the battle before. He has already won the battle for you. You just have to step out and do what he has called you to do. And so lastly for this chapter, we're going to read, You Are to Match Actions with, with Words. Okay. You are to match actions with words. And lastly, the law of defiance forces you to match actions with words. You see, it is in tough circumstances that the law of defiance is needed. When obeying this law, you must not just say stay stagnant. You do something, you move. The famine in Israel occasioned by the formidable siege of King Ben Hadad the king of Samaria, threw the Jews into an in, inexplicable period of hardship, so much so that the, the so much so that cannibalism was openly practiced among the inhabitants. The hardship was so unbearable that the head of a mole was selling for fifty dollars, an astronomical sum of money to poor people. And the fourth part of the cap of a dove, dove's, dove dog was sold for five pieces of silver. That's approximately three dollars. Second Kings 6 verse 24. Prophet Elisha looked the circumstances in the face and declared with all the boldness and power he could muster. By this time tomorrow, there shall be a major of fine flour. Three gallons sold for a few cents, and there shall be two measures of belly, six gallons of belly sold for the same amount, a few cents. Second Kings 7 verse 1. The statement was the most unbearable promise. It was the most astounding message that a mind could imagine. These people were starving to death, eating doves. Of awful, boiling one and one's another's children, entering into cannibalism, so terrible and stark. The famine that, when Elisha said such a thing as that, it was a greet, it was greeted with open ridicule, and it was so per perversive that the king's chief officer answered and said, "Why?" If God were to open the windows of heaven, and if God were to 
start manufacturing belly and wheat up there. And if God were to pour out upon us his manufacturing, but his manufactured product, what shall that thing be? Second Kings 7 verse 2. Understand the role played by the fourth leper in this story. There were the dreads of the earth, the reject, the reject, condemned to live in isolation and to die on song. Going inside Israel was not a dream because they were already thrown out from there. Staying where they were at the gate was not an option unless they were prepared to die of starvation. And going towards Samaria was not a thing to even begin to contemplate because to do so would mean to shorten the time of their impending misery, miserable deaths. But these were no ordinary leper. They were the type that carried an attribute of defiance in them, and they were ready to defile their circumstances. However, the outcome, and they did. They, they haggard, limping lepers, marched slowly but boldly towards the Samarian army, where at least they were a slimmer of hope of food. What a surprise! The sound of their tired and disease stricken steps were, make, were making the sound that their tired and disease stricken steps were making became magnified by God into a thunderous burst of thousands of donkey feet galloping with mighty warriors towards the Samaria. And they took to their heels, leaving behind an unprecedented and much needed food supply for the lepers. See what obeying the law of defiance can cause God to do. Amen. Amen. And so, what, what struck to me in this whole um, story from prophet Eliza and the lepers is that oftentimes when we step out, when we are convicted and we step out to do something for God, a lot of times we don't know how it's going to get done. And, but that's the point of faith. You, you don't know how it's going to get done. You just know that. You're trusting in God to do it. So as Prophet Eliza was making the decree, the lepers was just looking for some food. But God used both circumstances to fulfill the, the proclamation that was made by Elijah while also providing food for the lepers. And so God is always putting things in place. It's just up to us to defy our circumstances, to go, to step out in order for all things to come together, to work for the good of those that love in him. And so, Sister Amri, how would you add, or what, what did you take from this story of, you know, this serious famine that was happening, and how God used the lepers to fulfill everything that uh, Prophet Eliza had spoken? Well, um, a lot of things um, in this um, chapter is, I mean, um, got my attention. Uh, first was um, the, um, the famine. The famine was unthinkable. People were eating people's son, other people's son. So can you just imagine, this is like unthinkable, you know? <laughs> in modern times and thinking that people are eating other people's flesh that's whole um that that was that was one thing so the hardship was terrible was painful was i mean was unheard of um and you see that god positioned elijah as his uh, prophet 
he was the voice of God. He represented God in this season, in that hardship season. And when he prophesied that there will be um, there will be food, there will be, you know, there will be um, abundance. And you see that the officer of the king doubted the prophet. So which is the, the things that we've seen before. Um, Elijah was so convicted. However, the officers, ministers of the king, um, doubted him, doubted God, ridiculed him, and saying that, oh, can God do this? How he's going to do it? And um, he made fun of that. But, you know, Elijah told them, by tomorrow, by this time tomorrow, Elijah gave a timing. One thing that I do, um, that I do, um, observe that I do see in all those stories, there's always a timing with God. There's in the midst of chaos, in the midst of troubles, God will step in. He will provision in his own timing. And while um, Elijah was prophesying that by tomorrow there will be abundance, there will be plenty uh, for, for, um, for the nation, we also see the four lepers. You know, they also were starving. But where were they? They look at their conditions and then they said, well, you know, if I do this, I'm still going to die. If I do that, I'm still going to die. But may as well go to the camp of, you know, and then if I have to die, I will die. But I will take the risk to go onto the camp and then... And this is the risk sometimes you have to take. Now, looking at your conditions, they were lepers. I mean, in the Bible, lepers are people that are rejected from society. Um, they are people that are sick, you know. So um, they are outcast from the population. However, those four lepers didn't look at their situation. They already know they are the outcasts of that, you know, of that population of the world. However, they did not, they did not lament on their condition. They already know, you know, their condition. But they were willing to take the risk to still give themselves a chance. Sometimes you, you have to look at yourself. You have to look inwardly and then face your situation and allow yourself to come out of that condition. You first have to take on that responsibility. And that's what they did. They look inwardly and then they said, if I have to risk it, I'm already, <laughs> you know, I'm already about to die. But if I have to give myself a chance to live, that's restoration. Yes. Therefore, I'm going to do it. And they did it. And they were able to get food in that same time that Elijah prophesied that there will be plenty of food for everyone. And so, I guess my question that I would like to ask, you know, to whoever would want to answer do you feel that a lot of times, nowadays, we give up so easily when things don't go our way? Or we're not willing to take the risk? Or maybe we're willing to take the risk for about five minutes and then when it stops working, you know, we look for the alternatives. So why, why do you think that a lot of Christians tend to do that nowadays? I think um, often 
people are not willing to take the risk because of the unknown. That is one. And also, if you don't have conviction, deep conviction, you don't know what you're fighting for. You have to know what you're fighting for in order to take a risk, in order to, you know, to, to really get out of the condition that you're in, if you want a change. So you have to have deep conviction. You have to know who you are. And then as a believer, it's like, ultimately, who are you in Christ? And then not only who are you in Christ, but do you know God for yourself? Who is God for you? So if you box that God as some ordinary or that, you know, just an idea or a conception, therefore, yes, you're going to just not go for what you need. You're not going to take the risk. But once you know who you're serving, once you know who that God is, what he can do, therefore, this is that deep-rooted conviction. And you stand on it, and you'll be able to, um, you'll be able to amount to anything, will it? I do agree. I do, I do agree. Uh, 100% is your roots. So I do agree with her. Um, the things of God, you have to be firm. When you put, um, like the head is said, your words should match your actions. If you don't make a move, nothing will work. And that's how um, in our day-to-day -day life, we give in so easily. It's because of fear. We go back to fear. But now, fear will always be there. But then your roots in the things of God, um, your intimate relationship, your studies, uh, your prayer, your fasting, you know, those things prepare you like how David was prepared and, and, and Daniel was prepared to say, God, I'm not going to bow to this man. If it was anybody today, they might have bowed down and then go back and say, God, forgive me. You know he's the king. He was going to kill me. But you know, Daniel stood his ground. Daniel said that I'm not doing it because you are not my God. So he went back. And that just to tell us that everything that we do, we have to submit it back. Even though he has given us the ability to vision but then we'll still give it back to him, God. Is this really you? Are you telling me to do this? And then when he, uh, you know, give you an affirmation, he confirm a revelation, you take action. Yes, I see. Um, I just, uh, I, I don't want to add to what they're saying, but I just want to give my comment on what I read. I think what he says, match your word, actions with your word. You know, um, People will always say like you can't talk the talk if you can't walk the walk, you know. And that is and there is a funny thing that talking and working, walking is just two words that just change it. If you is the W and the T that just they all sound like brothers, you know. So and they both go hand in hand. And that is why there is this word said in Igbo, they call it equeme. And we have known God to be the talk and do. Is the talk and do God. So, and that's the comment I wanted to talk step in there. But in regards to this, we have always known the Bible to carry so much comprehension. It's like, we know that the Bible is an embodiment of prophecies. And they all, the funny thing is that they all start with P prophecies, promises, principles, proverbs, and parables. And purpose, still, if you want to add to the P is a lot. Purpose, Prophecies, parables, uh, promises, and principles. They are all embodied in the Bible. And this, this is one thing that I, I am so glad to highlight. The thing is that risk itself comes with fear. And permit me, like Paul said before, the Paul always said, um, um, Paul said, um, 
This is not the Spirit of God talking. This is me talking. I will put it like, faith without bricks is dead. Because every person that we know in the Bible, Esther, he took a risk. Right. He, he had faith, but he took a risk. So, uh, David, <laughs> that was risky. Yes. It, it was really risky. I won't lie to you. It wasn't something that is a guesswork. It was so faith without risks. I think it to be dead. It's like they say faith without work is dead. Yes. So, faith without risks is dead. And the thing is that, and I, I took from here is that the funny thing about them is that I'm not really sure that this lepers emphasizes on the promises or the prophecies that Elisha Elisha prophesied. I'm not sure they I'm not they, they, they never sounded like people that heard the prophecies. It was the kings and the people that were hungry that heard the prophecies more because in their dialogue with their fellow lepers, they knew that going to the uh, going back to the city, they are rejected already. <laughs> going forward, ah, we'll be dead. But maybe we might be better to be at the mercy of men than to stay here. Because they would have said, no, I'm going forward, they are not good. Going back, let's just stay here. So that thereby challenges me. That thereby challenges me that in my work with God, I have to incompromise. I have to incorporate risks in it. In everything in my work with God, I have to know that risk is one of them. Fear is going to be there. If I take fear out of that, I say, uh, uh, faith, faith, faith. If I take fear, uh, it will truncate me one day. So I have to compromise that, oh, there is fear. But faith over fear. You know? So I think that is the, that is the command. And, and the funny thing is that when they say talk and do, do, you, do we know that these people... These lepers were the ones that were more richer. The kings, they were eating left, leftovers. Do you know that they went pack, they pack all the all the things of the Samaria. They packed till they were full. And their conscience had to hold them. We have to go and tell the people in the city. If not, if not, they will maybe God will punish us. Yeah. And guess what? The kings and everybody, they came for leftovers. The, the lepers were the first to be privileged to the prophecies, to the abundance of the promises of God. So, sometimes, and they, why we had to really emphasize that there was because they said, let us go to Samaria. And they went. Some of us, we write resolution for the year. I want to go to the gym, but we never go. You know, so it, it is more, so faith it's not just about the talk, exercise, expression of words, affirmation of words in our heart. I am unstoppable. Have you even gone to somewhere that you are unstoppable before? Have you moved to the road and said that you are not stopped? You know, so we have never ever, we, uh, I believe that we Christians are more of the in-house Christian, but outside we are not Christian. We, we, are, we have so much faith inside the church, but when we go outside of the church, our faith, it's, uh, we are hidden. So I believe that this has really passed a lesson. Actually, this book, in reference to this, telling me that I must find words. If I said I'll take the risks, I must be willing to take the risks. Because in there, the thing is that these prophecies that I say, they are there. Like you said, situations may arise in the country, but the word of God has every prophecy. Yes. Every prophecy. The word of God has every prophecy in regards to any circumstances yes. you know so um, i think that is what i have to say Amen. thank you and um the last thing that i want to say for this portion with your you have to match actions and words someone that kept popping up to me was our dear uh, uncle prophet Apostle Peter, that's when he saw Jesus walking on the water, and he said, I want to go. Jesus said, come. And you see, he took the step to go. Because you can say, I want to do this. You can say it to the term blue in the face. I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to do this. But are you actually going to take the step to do it? Mm -hmm. Even if you see, you see that God is saying, 
you do it. When you say you want to do it, do it. But that fear can cripple you not to go. But are you willing to take the risk uh, to just step? Even if you sink, are you just willing to take the risk to step? Mm -hmm. Even if I die, at least I took the risk. You see, a lot of successful people took risks. They said, even if I don't succeed, and every single oh, successful people oh, yes. it's took risks. Right. Yeah. You can't just say, oh, I don't, I, I don't want to be poor. Okay, what are you willing to do? Are you willing to take your last hundred dollars and invest it in the stock markets on a business that maybe you don't a start a company? Are you willing to take the risk? Because many people have done it. And they bless the day that they did, that they took that risk. So just as people in the world can do this, how much more of us with the backing of God to be able to step out and take risks. You see, God is not God is not a God that just going to have a He doesn't want his children to be lazy. You have to step out and do something if you want what you say you want. God has given us everything that we need, everything to succeed. It's left to us whether or not we are willing to back our words up with the actions to walk in that conviction to defy our circumstances and to say okay God I'm going to do what you have told me to do whether I succeed or I fail now I'm left to you I have taken the step so as long as I take the step just continue to meet me where I'm at meet my, match my faith as I put my faith in you, match it. And God will do it. Mm -hmm. And so, now we are going to chapter 3. Components of the Law of Defiance. Okay. There are two critical components to the Law of Defiance. Faith and divine authority. Some people exercise faith but lack the knowledge to exercise authority when it matters. In comparison, others appear to exercise authority but lack the requisite faith to fire it, to fire it up. Therefore, for the law of defiance to function effectively, both components must work simultaneously. When faith matters most, Exercise of faith is the understanding, the conviction, and the absolute non-shaking reliance in the power of God to do what he says he will do, especially in the face of negative or non-conforming observed circumstances. This system throws up some things to ponder over. Faith is tested in adverse circumstances when you are at your wit's end, when everything seems to have fallen apart, when many things do not seem to make meaning anymore in your life, and yet everything is begging for answers. That is when your conviction of the ability of God to deliver and honor his word is put on trial. Trials, accidents, problems, sicknesses, societal and familial pressures, and tough circumstances test your faith. That explains why Peter, the apostle of Christ, had to make this statement in 1 Peter 1, 6-7. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The trials and the, prom the, trials and the problems and the difficulties that come into your life come not only to test, but to prove your faith in God. It is easy to claim to have faith when things go your way. 
It is easy to believe that God will do it when you do when you do not have to pray too hard and too long to get that next job. When you when you are yet to get that big breakthrough, and yet you are not doing badly at all. The excitement you display of the opportunity of God to still prove himself would not be lost on others. But true faith shows up when a combination of factors have has consolidated their strength, strangleholds on and rope you into a corner with no humanly apparent way of escape. True faith becomes apparent when your circumstances appear to be at variance with the words of God you have grown accustomed to all these years. When it does not look like it, when it does not look like it any longer, perhaps on account of your biological clock that is ticking too fast, or your low or no academic background, or even the unfamiliar and unfriendly environment that is making life not less depressing. When the fire in the furnace is burning bright and the heat produced menacing, that is when the faithful ones walk strong. Like the Bible says in Isaiah 48, 10, I have refined you, though not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. When others are running helter-skelter looking for people or places to put their trust in, or when some are devising some self-help tactics they believe will weather the storms for them, the heat of life causes the faithful believer to walk with his slash her head held high not because it's palatable to behave that way, but because they know in whom they have believed. Amen. 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 Wow. So, <laughs> faith and divine authority. So, this portion that I just read, it reminded me of 2023. And <laughs> it reminds me of 2023 because, you know, there are certain stages that we as Christians enter into where it seems like everything that we planned is not going the way that we expected. In fact, that's when everything is now turned upside down. And you're just, you're confused. You're at this point of, what do I do? I, I've prayed. I've fasted. I've sought the face of God. I'm waiting on the voice of God. And everything is saying, everything that's coming up is basically putting your faith to test and it's like, God is saying, do you trust me? When everything is going wrong, do you test me? When all your plans that you have set for yourself is not going according to what you expected, do you trust me? And so, as it talks about we as believers going through the furnace, how would how do you tie that back to the law of defiance? And I'll ask this to solo this question. Thank you. Um, going back to what you read, going back to what you read is the components. Components. What's he to put out? Where are you from? <laughs> yes, there's faith. There's divine authority. So that just tells me that there's authority, but as long as your authority is not defined, your victory might be for a time or a season. But then when you have divine authority, and then you match that with your faith in Christ Jesus, because it's important, because we see 
that non-believers being successful in things, they might not believe in Christ Jesus. That's why their success just lasts for a season. But the second thing that they hold on to, to make them be driven, you know. So I think these two components, you have to exercise. You have to exercise them. Jumping in the fire, the Hebrew guys, I will still go to the story, is because they have faith. They have the conviction, the word of God, to actually show God approve for the life so they jump in the fire. You know, that's that's what I take from it, that you have to make these two come together. You have to exercise these two. And still go back to our last um, passage that our words have to match with our actions. Amen. Okay. Um, my comment on this is that as he highlights that where faith is needed the most, um, and it shows us all kinds of um, tragedy or things that, or afflictions that might uh, come around or like encompass a Christian. And this is in the midst of this. Do we have faith? Um, the faith is that are we still knowing that even in the midst of this, God still got us. You know, um, David will sing in Psalm. He said, uh, "He said, why do you cast down my soul? Why do you groan within me?" But he said again, "Hope in God, and I will praise Him, my salvation and my God." <laughs> it is contradicting. You know, if you hear him sing this up, you see that he will say, Father, why do you cast down my soul? Why do you groan within me? But at the end of it, he said, you know what? You are my salvation of mine. You are my, last, last, I, I can't go. Even though you are weeping me right now, even though I'm in mourning, but you know that you are holy. It, it will, so it, it gives me a consolation that it is okay. That is, that is the difference between murmuring and I don't know, I don't know, but murmuring and when you are groaning within you. Murmuring and groaning. They are two different things. So, and it shows us like in our affliction, this is where faith is needed the most. You know? Before we move to you having an authority, but because every, every affliction, every situation, every negative thing that happens to a believer or a Christian, this, it is there that your faith is tested. His faith was even, it was strengthened even more. And so I just like to encourage everybody that's going through something tough right now that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And you should always pick up what God is trying to teach you in these seasons where He is taking you through certain trials and tribulations. Because what you learn in this season, you will be able to apply it to the next season. But if you don't learn anything, how will you be able to succeed in the next one? And so I just like to thank my lovely panelists once again for joining us. You know, and I pray that the viewers gain a lot through this topic. And you know, I learned a lot, and I'm sure that as we continue to dive into future perfect that we will gain even more understanding and knowledge on the ways and the things of God. So thank you and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Oh, my friends, my family, my fans out there, how are you all doing? I am Dexmond Walter Oreahi. Uh, first, I want to introduce these books that a friend of mine, Edwin, introduced to me. I want you to go have a taste of it. Are you tired of unanswered and ineffective prayers? Are you really tired of, of unanswered and ineffective prayers? Need to learn targeted and effective prayers? Just go get these books. Just go get, go get it. The first one is God of Judgment. And the other one is Second Chance. Written by Pastor Dr. Jerry Udo. Just go get this book. Okay? And see it to the turnaround. There is power mighty in the word of God. Alright.
Bye.